My name is Michael Goldberg, and I'm the executive director of our um, Yale Institute for Entrepreneurship at Case Western Reserve University. I'm also uh, an associate professor at the Weatherhead School of Management, which is David's alma mater, um, sitting down the hall from, with some of your friends here, Kale Luntinen and others who are actively involved in our, our doctorate of management program, which, from which David is a graduate, and, and Kale was the one who made the introduction, so I appreciate that. Kale, if you're watching. Um, it's great to welcome David Klossner to our um, CWRU uh, Entrepreneurship Alumni Speaker Series. Um, we're thrilled that Jessica Harding, who is a, an undergraduate EE major here in Cleveland, but not on campus at the moment. She's um, doing a co-op this semester at Rockwell. And we got to know Jessica this summer. She was one of our great student participants in our remote entrepreneurship project program. So was interning with the startup and doing work in the coding and other spaces. So um, Jessica, it's great to, to see you here today. Um, the way that we'll do this, and thanks for those of you who are joining us on Zoom. Um, if you have a question that you wanna feed to Jessica, just let her know in the chat that either you have a question, you can sort of raise your virtual or real hand, um, or you can put the question in the chat and Jessica can either just call on you to unmute to, to say it directly or to, um, or she can read it for you. And if you're watching on LinkedIn Live, um, you can uh, just put your question in the comment bar and I will feed the question or Doug DiGiralmo will to Jessica. So with that, um, David, thank you again for joining us and I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, as Michael said, I'm a BSMS student in electrical engineering here at Case and um, I'm super excited to talk with uh, David Klossner today about um, his experience in manufacturing startups. So uh, David, if you're, there, um, we could, if we want to get started, you could give us like a brief overview of your career. Yeah, let's get started. So, um, I'm uh, 60 years old. I um, went to uh, mechanical engineering school, and I also have a degree in finance and marketing from an MBA uh, from Northern University, Illinois, and then. Um, received a PhD in sustainable business practices from Case um, in 2014. That's the educational background for the most part. Uh, from a career perspective, um, started out in engineering, got into sales, and then got into sales management. And then um, in, I'd say in the mid, uh, early 90s, uh, started uh, becoming financially responsible for companies, general manager or president, and uh, my last couple jobs has, uh, has been um, president and CEO of different companies. And i um, really fortunate that uh, others have uh, been uh, very, uh, uh, the outcome has been positive. So uh, yeah, so that's a brief overview. Um, also in the, in the Marine Corps, I'm a pilot, and um, yeah, that's about, that's, that's pretty much covered. Um, yeah, so right now you're a president of KDA Manufacturing. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so KDA is uh, the initials of my three kids, uh, one of which is Kendra, Dylan, and Audrey. And it's my wife and I. Um, who have started this business, and it was a greenfield startup, meaning that it was from zero. So it wasn't uh, a brownfield or an existing operation. So we built our facility, and we did it in a manner that which sort of aligns with my education at Case. It was a green facility, a LEED compliant and European daylight standard compliant facility. It's beautiful. I like it. It's what I, it's what I liked, and um, we started this business from zero. So we hired employees, and we seeked customers, and started that. And that our first order was shipped in July of 2017. And uh, prior to that, uh, we got our occupancy to our building in January of 2017. And it's uh, 
it's been a, it's basically been a everyday sprint to grow this business. Um, we've been um, negatively impacted by COVID, and we can talk about that a little bit later. Now, what we focus on, what if you have a, you know, the one or two uh, sentence elevator speech of what is KDA? We're a heavy manufacturer, so we we take steel components mostly. We do stainless and other alloys, but for the most part, we take steel. We uh, weld on it, we cut it, we form it, and then we machine it, and then we uh, assemble it. And then because most of the time what we're doing is fairly large, we get involved with painting it and uh, shipping it. Um, in fact, we had a super load coming out of Cleveland the first of the year, which was uh, 23 feet in, uh, in width. And it was, uh, it was uh, basically five escorts, so it's uh, right up our alley. And that's, that's sort of like what we do. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how, like, with a startup, how do you identify gaps in the market to target? Yeah, Jessica, that's a great question. So, um, a lot of times, identifying market opportunities is is luck. It's a lot of hard work, and it's also um, trying to anticipate what you believe could be a trend. So, for KDA. I felt as though there was an opportunity for manufacturers to reshore some of the manufacturing that they have taken offshore to like China and, and other countries. So I thought that that was a market in this area, uh, a market opportunity for this area. And, uh, and that was vetted a couple times uh, a few years before we started the company. And if you look at, uh, you know, Ohio is in the middle of the Rust Belt. If you look at the Rust Belt chronological uh, uh, history of it, you know, a lot of that business has moved out. And I felt like there was an opportunity for some of that to move back. And I think that this pandemic may have uh, heightened that with, uh, you know, it's important for us to be able to make things as, uh, as simple as respirators and chemicals for vaccines and other things. It's looking at what opportunities that others may not serve at that particular point. And um, speaking of COVID, could you speak a little bit about how you guys have tried to adapt to the pandemic with its ever pervasive effects? Yeah, so the pandemic is um, has been devastating to KDA. It's been one of the challenges. And when you look at entrepreneurial mindset, you must be prepared and overcome challenges and setbacks. In this pandemic, um, I mean, if you read uh, the news, of course, and you listen to companies like Boeing and others, it's it's a huge, uh, significant uh, setback. So it's a negatively affected KDA significantly. So we've uh, adjusted our workforce, and now we've been spending an enormous amount of time trying to create a positive cash flow. And that's been our priority. Um, and it's, uh, we've looked at many different opportunities and uh, right now I don't necessarily have the perfect answer, but we do have some plans in place that will help us to survive. Because once we do survive, I do believe, albeit our economy will come back uh, gradually, it will eventually come back and succeed what it was before the pandemic. So as you've uh, started a few startups now, could you speak a little bit on the key traits and skills that you think you need to be an entrepreneur? Yeah, so KDA, KDA is uh, my fifth startup. Um, the fourth one was in uh, India. The uh, third one was in uh, Budapest. Uh, and then we did a startup here in Ohio and then one in Chicago. So, you know, Doing a startup is, um, you have to have a vision of sort of like what you believe the desired outcome is going to be. And you need to be able to see that outcome in your mind's eye. And that's that's sort of your guiding light. And, um, 
and I visit that mindset, uh, you know, that what I what I had hoped our desired outcome was going to be. And uh, so you need to have a plan of what you hope to achieve. Um, you need to be able to overcome challenging situations, that's for sure. Skills, um, you know, expanding your skill set, continuously sharpening the saw, and understanding what you're doing. I mean, the internet is such a phenomenal tool, and it's pretty much, you know, during the week, I work on dealing with all the situations that we have at KDA, and basically Saturday and Sunday, I spend most of the day just researching different aspects of what uh, KDA is going to be involved with opportunities. So it's expanding your your skill sets, continuously, just continuously sharpening the saw, and then you know problems. You're going to be faced faced with problems. It's just the way it is. As soon as you do something, as soon as you ship that first product, as soon as you hire that first employee, as soon as you start that first machine, as soon as you break the ground to erect the building, it, you're going to have problems. And you you, you can, uh, you got to be able to overcome those problems. And it helps to be able to overcome those problems if you try to approach them uh, at times from a different context. So, you know, this is how we should, this is what I believe the immediate approach is to this problem, but there may be another idea, or there may be another approach, or there may be a whole different way that that problem wouldn't even be there if you looked at a different opportunity. And then uh, I think the last two things are energy and effort and, and, and just uh, I guess I call it value-added motion. Just <laughs> work and try to be valuable of what you uh, to the outcome of what you were hoping to achieve. So, um, you know, just uh, being a hard worker is important, and, uh, and value-added motion. So I would say those were the key skills that uh, I I think that entrepreneurs need. And, and I think it applies not only to people that make things like KDA, but there's a lot of other entrepreneurs that provide value in services. So what they make is a service. And I think that same skill set applies to that as well. Can you think of some time in your career where one or all of these skills have like particularly come in handy? <laughs> well, um, Yeah, I mean, when you when we started KDA, um, you know, I'll, I'll just tell you a couple stories. We started KDA. We bought uh, a parcel of land not too far from here. Uh, we went through all the research of the land. We did a, pulled all the permits. We did everything that was ready to go. We had our contract in place, and uh, a, a day before close, the uh, the guy that I was buying the land from said, "I don't want to sell it." And it's like, uh, you know, that's that that was a problem. It was a lot of effort, and it, uh, you know, basically, you know, what do you do? You can't, you can't, uh, you can't immediately force the guy to sell I mean, because it, you know, there's laws in place against that kind of action. But you know, we uh, so we had to start over, and that cost us uh, approximately nine months of a lot of effort to basically find a new parcel of the land and. Uh, and start the start over. And it happened to be in a different county, so we had to pull permits. We had to go through zoning. We had to go through variances. We had to have town hall meetings, and you know, and it's like you know, that's a that's a that's a time where you have to be able to overcome, and you just can't give up. Um, so that would be one example of KDA. Um, you know, there's other examples that. Uh, that uh, you know overcome what I thought were challenging situations. That uh, again, if you're going to be an entrepreneurial person with that mindset, you be prepared to overcome challenges. Yeah. So if we could backtrack a little bit. I know you mentioned that you some of your startups were in other countries, and I was wondering if you could speak on the differences between uh, what it is like have a startup like here in Ohio versus, um, I believe you said uh, Budapest, right? 
Yeah. So uh, this building um, is the exact same building we built in India. Uh, we built in Budapest, and it's very similar to the buildings that we built in Chicago and in, in, uh, in Medina, Ohio. So I started with the building because what part of our strategy is to build big things. I like making big things. It's just, you know, it's just it's it's interesting to me. So when you make big things, you have to have the facility to be able to get those things in and out of the building. You have to be able to lift them up. And so typically you don't find the type of building that uh, you need uh, waiting out there because of the size and height and door openings and power. So you usually start with the building once you've identified the market opportunity. So in India, we identified a, a uh, basically, I visited every city of any size and determined what climate, what uh, what employment skills that were available, infrastructure opportunities, uh, what was going to be easy for me to get in and out of there type of thing as far as flights. And so we chose uh, outside of Bangalore. And so we started the building process. And that, you know, that was a little tricky because um, the quality standards for um, building components is not the same, so uh, we had some issues there. So you have to be careful. You know, when you're lifting a lot of weight with overhead cranes, you got to make sure your components are built to a certain standard. So you have to uh, establish uh, quality requirements for your operation because you don't want a building that's going to fall down. Um, and then uh, hiring people was, uh, I would say, was uh, the next challenge in India and. Um, Unlike uh, the United States, um, there was a uh, there was a surplus of people. Uh, finding employees wasn't difficult. We could find many employees, and so uh, we did. Uh, we went through a very elaborate screening process, and once we found a dozen or so welders and a dozen or so engineers, uh, we brought them to the United States and started training them in our standards um, here. And uh, you know, that was a little interesting. And, and then once the business got, uh, once we got the employees in place and we started uh, uh, installing our equipment, a lot of the similar, a lot of the same challenges you have for starting a business from scratch are the same. So we, we had to find out which employees were, uh, were going to get on the bandwagon, so to speak, and how, what skill sets we had and, and what, uh, what opportunities we could leverage off based on those skill sets that we found. And that, that business, fortunately, uh, uh, took off. And it serviced not only the emerging economy requirements for power in India, but it also was able to uh, provide uh, components elsewhere in, the elsewhere in the world at a very economical so I would say a lot of the similarities are the same. Uh, you know, you always have the travel issues, and you know, India is a. Um, the, you know, the, there's there's challenges in India just getting around, and being able to um, drink and eat without getting sick. You know, that's a that's a challenge there. And, you know, and we work through all that. Our facility. One or two differences are facility in India because of the challenges of uh, making sure we controlled our water supply and our food supply. We built our own uh, offices and uh, apartments at that facility, and uh, we made sure we had a, a very secure water supply, uh, reverse osmosis, chemical treatment, and all that other stuff. So I felt like we could uh, have a lot of our employees from the states go there and not become ill, because that turned out to be a very much of a challenge. So, um, How was your uh, process of interview different in India than it was in the United States? Well, Karen, the, the, uh, the interviewing process was very similar. Um, most of the people in India who would be interested in these kind of jobs with this kind of a multinational company speak English. So um, 
communication from that perspective wasn't really that hard. Uh, understanding what their skill sets were and how it related to what we required, uh, that took a little bit of a time, but uh, when we brought the welders and the engineers to Ohio, and they basically were here for about nine months, uh, we worked in that. And, and I would say these guys, uh, Indians, uh, as a rule, are very proud people and they want to do right. And so the, in, the engineers and the welders, these guys became very skilled, uh, very, uh, you know, we had certified welders and they became extremely uh, gifted at, that, at those skills as, as well as the uh, engineers. Um, so I actually had noticed, but uh, James asked a question in the chat. Uh, James, if you want to unmute and ask it yourself. Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you, David. Um, I was curious uh, when you kind of thought about becoming an entrepreneur, there's the buy versus build decision. Um, you've taken the startup way of kind of uh, building your own companies and uh, our, our beloved gorilla kind of taught, you know, that's one of the ways also buying a company can be a way of, of ameliorating the early risks of failure for new businesses. So I just wondered what your calculus was on that uh, and how you arrived at this decision and your thoughts on that, please. Thank you. Yeah, James. So um, I've been uh, involved with basically all three different types of uh, building expansions, uh, you know, market business expansions, the greenfield, as we're talking about now, the acquisition side, and then the brownfield, where basically you're buying a, an operation. It may not be what exactly you want to do with that operation, but there's something that's already there in place, and you're going to take that existing either business model or, or facility and move it into a different direction. So um, the, the acquisition uh, side of the business expansion um, in many ways, it's a lot easier than a greenfield. Uh, you have leverage in, in many, uh, you, have, you have employees that have established habits uh, that, you know, in a greenfield, you have nothing. I mean, when we, when we, you know, we were installing our equipment and we didn't have all our concrete floors in already. So, and that's difficult to hire certain people because they walk in and they say, well, you don't have a floor. How do you want? And it's like, well, yeah, I'll have a floor in here in a couple of weeks. So uh, from an uh, from a employee perspective, acquisitions and brownfields are significantly easier um, because they, they've established themselves that you know, as a rule, humans are creatures of habit. So they, they're going to the same place and they're typically going to hang in there with you for a while. Uh, until you can uh, get them to understand what your strategy is. Uh, so I would say the human side of it is much easier with the with an acquisition of ground food. Um, and then of course, a lot of times, um, you know, that saying it is much easier to review than it is to do. And what I mean by that is, you know, it, I've turned around several businesses that were losing on an annual basis, millions of dollars, and that is much easier than a greenfield because you can walk in, and because your perspective on it is is it's not it's not uh, twisted by whatever you've been living there, and so you're able to see things that are broken fairly quickly, make changes, and so uh, from that perspective, it's 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 much easier. So. I tried the acquisition uh, before we started KDA. I was involved with uh, I don't know, about a dozen due diligence, um, and uh, we made offers on uh, four or five of those companies, and they either fell out because of environmental concerns, legacy concerns with their facility from an environmental perspective. Um, their financials were um, a little bit uh, overstated, so there was that perspective. Or typically, uh, you're dealing, at least at the level that I was involved with, you're dealing with an entrepreneur 
that you know when you start a business that's your baby uh you know, my wife and i have talked that you know we've had four kids we've been blessed with three beautiful healthy kids and kdas are are four so uh, you know from that perspective it's um, you know the entrepreneur sometimes even though they may think they want to sell it they don't at the very last minute because it's their kid it's their baby uh, so david i can't help but joking since two of your kids are on when you were saying that you had three beautiful kids i was like i hope he's not going to say that one of his kids on this call is not beautiful so <laughs> glad that well, his kda was your fourth i was getting a little worried yeah, and Michael, actually, all three of my kids are on Kendra. Here's oh, my. Oh, funny. Okay, I didn't, I didn't pick that the last name. How funny. Okay, even yeah. more, even more relieved now that all three are on that you didn't say any of them. Well, and I actually have uh, four on because I consider uh, Bill, her husband, uh, one of the family. So uh, we have all four of our uh, right. kids on. Um, so this actually feels like a great segue to go into a question that Michael asked, which was, um, uh, how has it been different starting a company with your family members versus business partners? I, I only put it in the chat. That all that was a plant from uh, Audrey, so I was just sharing it, not for me. I have to give credit where credit is due. Well, um, I am probably one of the most luckiest guys you're ever going to find because I have a beautiful wife. And she is just a really good person. And we have learned how to work together. And that has been, that has been a challenge at times. Um, you know, uh, as a rule, my personality is intense. When I'm at work, I work. I, I, there's, no, there's no playing around. It's, it's uh, you know, very intense. Um, when um, when your wife uh, walks into your office and and says something that is uh, not necessarily what you're interested in, uh, you you must be able to handle that situation in a manner that doesn't get her mad at you. And and that is you know that's been hard for me. I think I've learned how to do it, and I also think she's also learned that um, you know just how I am at work. Um, so, um, but it's also been a real blessing because um, I like looking at her. I find her very attractive, so that's nice. So during the day, I can just walk out my door and see this person that I really uh, love, and, and that's nice. And, uh, you know, she's kind to me during the day, which you know, typically uh, when you're, you know, president and CEO, uh, that doesn't happen. So. Um, and she has, you know, on certain aspects of the business that, um, frankly, and, um, you know, she handles all our payroll, she handles all the IT, um, all structural requirements. She's been involved with our ISO registration. Uh, we're an ASME pressure vessel shop. She did all that work. She's involved, you know, we're partnering with OSHA. Uh, we're trying to achieve this sharp uh, certificate. She's done all that. So I am uh, I'm blessed to have that. And I think now, uh, going forward, I don't want it any other way. So I, it's, it's, uh, it's a good thing. That was really sweet. <laughs> yeah. If we want, I think Dylan actually has a question on your uh, environmental practices. Uh, yeah. Dylan? Yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks, Jessica. Um, I was hoping that uh, Michael would also ask and say this is a plant too, but that's okay. Um, so, uh, David, I think uh, I think everyone is probably very interested in hearing about um, some of the sort of some of the big details and the small details when it comes to the plant that you built in Norton, uh, specifically with regards to sort of the environmental. Um, friendly things and innovations that you've added during the construction process? Yeah, good question. So, you know, the environmental uh, approach that we took to this building uh, started from the ground up. So uh, we 
um, went out and sought and found um, basically recycled bricks and stone. So the, the foundation of all our drives and and the pad inside the building that that was recycled. Uh, prior to that, or during all that construction, um, I drove around northeast Ohio looking for bridges, overpass bridges on the major highways that were being torn down. And we were fortunate to find a bridge on I-70 going into Wheeling, West Virginia. We basically bought the bridge and we trucked the bridge here. And so every, and this is not an exaggeration, every structural member of our building was the I-70 bridge going into Wheeling, West Virginia. Um, part of our building, the exterior panels came from a FedEx facility in New Hampshire. And, you know, just that's, that's basically one component of that lead compliant, uh, uh, compliant uh, certificate we were chasing. Our windows, um, we bought our windows, these, all our windows were slated for the aquarium in Atlanta and they were just about ready to all be destroyed but we bought them from the window distributor they turned out that they shouldn't have the UV film that typically everybody wants in their windows because they don't want the UV to be blocked for the aquarium because the animals that's not what they wanted so you know a huge portion of our building is from recycled components so that's the biggest part. In fact, we're doing that again. We just bought um, basically a third of the bridge here in, in Barberton, Ohio on Wooster Road and I-76 and we're looking at uh, building our next facility. Went with extra heavy insulation in the roof and wall including our doors, which is unusual. We have all LED lights. Every light in the day, they're all in motion. We don't have a switch in the plant, so uh, everything's based on motion. So there'll be times that the plant will be in dark in a certain area when you know, there's no activity going on. Uh, we went with a geothermal uh, heat pump system. In fact, Dylan and Bill Bergen were instrumental in wrapping the coils as we buried them in the ground. So that's just the name, a few things um, that, you know, that we implemented. And, you know, not all that was economical. We, we could have done a few things, probably a little bit more economical if we'd have chosen to go new. But I also think that the product that we got at the end of the day turned out to be just uh, what I was hoping for. And we, we were blessed to be written up in one of the local newspapers, you know, green, you know, green manufacturing or green plant boost in order. So, and it's, uh, I don't know, I, I like doing it that way. Yeah, uh, yeah. so um, besides uh, your environmental choices, for sustainability through manufacturing, which I think is really cool. Can you speak to some other KDE's accomplishments that you're proud of? Well, um, yeah. <laughs> so we had t anticipated, you know, whenever you start a business, especially a green field, you know, you have to have that first uh, money up front to to put the you know to buy the capital to buy the, the, the capital expenditures for building equipment and all that stuff, and then you have to have operational capital uh, to to fund your payroll because you know at the beginning you you have to have people here before you have sales. So our goal was to be uh, cash flow uh, neutral or positive within three years, and and in the past when I've started an operation three years on a manufacturing uh, from a cash flow perspective hitting cash flow neutral or cash flow positive in three years in three years for a manufacturer that's that's pretty good what I was proud of is uh, KDA did it in two um, which was a lot of work um, so 
Uh, we became profitable in the middle of 2019, right at two years. That's something to be proud of. Um, you know, our facility is, uh, it's been recognized by many. We've had a lot of uh, interest in our facility, so I'm pleased with that. And you know what, we, we, we've got some good employees. Um, you know, guys that um, care. And, you know, some of the equipment we've installed, and we installed all of our equipment ourselves, it's big. So I, I'm proud of the equipment that we've installed and how quickly we were able to get it to contribute. So I would say those were those were the key, key things. I mean, you know, if you look at startups as a rule, you're going to see that a, a significant portion, like 90% of them, fail. So it's, uh, you know, I don't feel like we have, we have a challenge with this pandemic, but, uh, you know, we were being, we were, we were achieving that prosperous side, which was, that's also a nice accomplishment. Uh, so it looks like Brian also has a question. Brian, if you want to unmute and uh, ask it. Uh, sure. Thank, thank you, Mr. Klausner, for your, for your story. Um, I guess I'll just read what I, what I wrote is that, you know, not that long ago, you know, the banking community was like literally abandoning smaller firms such as yours. I mean, of course, the crisis of eight and nine, uh, if you talk to any the smaller folks in manufacturing in that period, they remember the day their bank called them and shut their revolver. Um, you know, and this, what intrigued me about this uh, your presentation is this idea of a manufacturing startup, which, like I say, startup and manufacturing don't often go together, at least in my experience. So I'm, I'm just kind of wondering, how do, you, um, how do you undertake this endeavor, which is complicated enough as it is, right? Uh, the startup of Greenfield. Uh, operation um, when there's you know there's not a lot of people jumping on your bandwagon I would would imagine I, I can't I, I have imagined you reach, uh, incur some skepticism and people who are not buying into your vision readily well Brian you um, you're you're a hundred percent correct um, banks will run away from you if you say the word startup. Uh, they just, they're not, they're not designed to service startups. And it's not all the bank's fault. Um, a lot of them uh, have certain regulations that are difficult to meet for a startup. But I would say the vast majority of the reason why banks are not startup friendly is because they're so risk averse. And so, you know, I've always said, and my kids have heard this probably a hundred times, banks will only loan you money when you don't need it. So uh, a startup is, yeah, that's, that's tough. And you hit it right on the head. I mean, 99% of the people don't realize how much of a fight it is to do a greenfield just from the funding perspective. So, you know, I could tell you a quick story about KDA. We were fortunate enough, we had enough capital to uh, get the building erected, and once you got the once we, we got the building erected, not not necessarily move in stake, but erected. We didn't really have the doors in, we didn't have any roads in, we didn't have any floor in, we didn't have any lights, electrical. We had nothing but the building erected. Then a banker can come up here and he can see something, and then so we funded our, our project ourselves with our own capital just to get the building erected, and then. Now, uh, banks go crazy on cash flow. I mean, cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. So uh, you have to be able to generate cash. And, um, you know, a lot of times a startup, you don't generate cash for the first few years, and that scares bankers. So, uh, and I, I would say, based on what we've uh, recently experienced with the pandemic, uh, you know, we have exhausted uh, pretty much every other opportunity for refinancing including the SBA. Uh, the SBA is, uh, they also have some pretty significant guidelines on what they can do and what they can't do. And, you know, startups are, are somewhat difficult for them. Um, but, you know, they do some startups, but 
you know, Brian, you also were wise that you don't see very many manufacturing startups, greenfields, in North America anymore, and that's a, that's a sort of sad. And I hope I hope that somehow we can maybe change that, at least at least from the SBA, the Small Business Administrative perspective, to to help uh, to help nurture that environmental or that uh, manufacturing entrepreneurial spirit. So um, I hope I. I uh, answered your question, Brian. Um, yeah, thank you. You did, and you know, I, uh, and I can't imagine venture capital is lining up at your door either. Um, maybe they are, but that's not my space. I, I'm a shop rat myself, so I don't, you know, I, I'm not so well versed in those things. But uh, uh, I would say also I have some experience in family business, and uh, that's probably your greatest asset right there. I would imagine, uh, you know, hearing you speak, uh, only, perhaps only a family could get through this sort of process. Yeah, so the uh, venture capital guys, your private equity guys, all those guys, uh, um, they, they're they not too interested in green fields because of the cash flow thing. I mean, those guys live on cash flow. And a lot of times what their concept is, and, and I don't necessarily, uh, and I believe they bring value to many situations, but a lot of times their goal is to buy, flip, and buy and turn, buy and flip the business. And what they're looking for is, that, and this is why they're doing it, is to, to generate a value to themselves or some of the people that have invested. So they're always looking, once they do an acquisition, what's their exit strategy? So, and that's not all for all of them, but a vast majority of them. Now there's some that have started out saying they're a little bit different, but. Uh, so venture capitalists, the private equity guys, and typically they're expensive. Um, you know, they're running, you know, it's not uncommon for them to be a 10%. And, uh, you know, they, and they want to, they want to lie and share of the, of the pot. So, yeah, so financing a, a green field. Uh, and I was, I would highly recommend that uh, anybody who takes on a manufacturing green field, that they, they really need to think about how they're going to finance this thing for at least three months on a cash flow basis. Or not three months, three years, pardon me, three years on a cash flow basis. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I was hoping to backtrack a little bit. Um, what got you interested in kind of pursuing startups and going into like, the entrepreneurial space in the first place? Well, um, I like making things. So, you know, it's either making a business or expanding a business or um, taking that business and making it better. You know, the business we had in Chicago when I got there it was very limited on what they did. And so, you know, we expanded. We got into bigger and better, I thought, better things. And uh, that business has uh, continuously prospered and done well. So. Um, I, I, it's making things better. That's just, I guess, the, the bottom line. So, um, Jessica, I hope I answered that question. Um, you know, just looking at a situation and say, well, you know, you've got a huge asset with these people, your employees, and they've got skills that can be transferred to maybe other products that, that currently there's not a lot of people in that space. So why don't we try that? And, that, and, that, and that's worked out. Uh, well, in several situations. And then it looks like we might be running out of time. So uh, this will be the last question, unless anyone put something in the chat pretty soon. Um, but I was wondering if you had any advice for like young entrepreneurs, like what are some of the biggest takeaways of your career? Well, um, yeah. I think that creating something that that has uh, basically not existed prior to you being involved is really, it's just cool. You know, it's just like, at the end of the day, it's just, it's just really fun. It's a lot of work, but it's fun. And, and you think about, you know, some of the people that I uh, have been 
uh, fortunate enough to hire and how they prospered and how they have uh, just grown. It, it, it's just creating opportunities for others. It's, uh, it's, it's really sort of fun too. In a lot of ways, there's some analogies, many analogies between, you know, you decide to have a child. Well, that's a lot of work. And if you do it right, you're going to make a heck of a commitment. You're going to sacrifice some of the hobbies that you had and the, and the things that you did prior to having a child. And then you're really going to make that a project. And you're going to spend all this time trying to nurture this, this being. Well, that's the same thing as a business. You're going to try to nurture this thing to grow it and to get it bigger and better and, and have it do this and that and other things that make it, it gives it more opportunities and gives it more ways to grow in different in different scenarios instead of just one you know there's that it just it, it it's very similar to that and then when you see that child grow to walking and then you know and become a, a young adult and and watch that child go out and have their own family and, and it's like wow that's cool and so that's sort of like a business you you know like the business we had in, in ohio it was you know, it was negatively affected by the, the economy downturn in 2009. So we, we sort of stuck our head up and say, okay, yeah, if the economy in, in North America is sort of soft. So what should we do? Well, let's go build a facility in India and let's go buy a company up in Canada and let's go do something over in Eastern Europe because those guys need power. So it's, it's trying to find things to do better value added. Wow, that's a that's a great answer. Um, thank you so much for your time, David. And I'm going to throw it back to you, Michael. Great. And Jessica, thank you for moderating. Um, one of the real pleasures of, of this series is seeing students like Jessica sort of step into the moderating role. We, we saw we saw how challenging moderating can be on the national stage this week. So seeing our students, future Chris Wallace here, um, learn, you know, cutting their moderating chops uh, in our speaker series is always great. Um, David, thank you for joining. I think your, um, your uh, sharing the story, and I think as, as Brian had mentioned, you know, we don't have a lot of speakers in our speaker series that are doing things in the manufacturing space and um, hearing the journey and, you know, it's, it's as much of a startup as anything else. And I think, you know, as James was mentioning, some of the lessons even from professors like Richard Osborne, who um, taught here and, and working with folks who are sort of looking at sort of building and, or acquiring businesses in sort of more traditional spaces is something or, or stories that are important to share. I also would say as a parent of three kids, a, a son and two daughters, it's awesome seeing your kids grown and working and, and being part of today's session. My kids are all in high school, so I'm hoping someday they'll be back joining me in some session. So, um, Dylan, Audrey, and Kendra, thank you so much for joining with your dad today. And David, thank you for taking the time. Yeah, this is uh, I, um, this was enjoyable. Jessica, you did a phenomenal job. Every interaction I've had with you has been positive. I think that. Thank you. And uh, thanks for quite. You know, you don't really prepare for something like this, and I um, I thought that. Uh, it was easy, so thank you.